So do you see the, the screen? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be in this uh, uh, very interesting uh, session. I will uh, talk mostly uh, about um, uh, the new entrants and incumbents and um, competitive strategies or cooperative strategies uh, between them. And I base my comments on some relatively recent work, which I have published in the annual review of financial economics and also in a report of the banking initiative here at, uh, at ESC. Uh, so let me just start very briefly, although uh, quite a few things have been said by the people that have preceded me, um, that the impact of uh, fintech and, and big tech is, uh, is important and rising, uh, but really is differential, so it's not uniform across regions and jurisdictions and sectors. So it's quite important in, in payments, you know, for example, uh, is impacting not only national payments, but cross-border payments is quite important and, and growingly important in credits, for example, in mortgages in, uh, in the US, for example. Uh, it has extended the market, um, uh, allowing much more financial inclusion uh, of people, in particular in emerging and developing countries that had no access to financial uh, services. We have seen uh, this already. Uh, today, and also uh, another point that uh, I think has already been made, uh, uh, all this, uh, in particular in emerging and developing economies, uh, has been uh, allowed or, or has been possible because of technological leapfrogging, so people that have never had a bank account, uh, then bank with a mobile um, uh, phone. Um, lending uh, in particular, by, uh, by big tech and big tech uh, uh, in general is raising rapidly, but there are differences among regions. So typically, uh, big tech uh, is gaining and has gained more traction in emerging and developing uh, economies, while fintech uh, has gained more uh, and other fintechs, which are not, not, not um, you want the services not provided by big tech platforms, uh, more, um, they have made more inroads uh, in more advanced economies. So here we see, for example, not in big tech um, um, being more predominant in, in uh, Argentina, Brazil, uh, China, uh, than in the uh, United Kingdom of, uh, or the US where other fintech are much more important. And, and Korea, South Korea, it's, it's a particular, uh, in this case, is a, is a particular case. Let me, uh, uh, highlight uh, because uh, let me compress you know, the, the points uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, what, as uh, I perceive, what are the advantages and disadvantages of fintech? Um, the advantage um, are uh, superior technology, which is free of legacy systems. For example, uh, you have to use the mainframe, the heavy and, and not flexible mainframes, and you uh, can use directly the cloud computing and linear operation uh, systems. It has a, a friendly consumer interface, which is new standard for consumer experience, in particular uh, based on the mobile uh, phone. It focuses also, I may focus, and it has focus, the entrance have focus on activities and business segments with higher uh, returns. For example, uh, payments and cross payments, where the intermediation margins uh, were quite fat and there was quite a bit of inefficiency uh, as we have seen also uh, in other talks today. Um, also, they uh, typically uh, have been operating with more equity funding than, uh, 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 than banks, although this is variable and, and it may uh, depend on, on sectors. And quite importantly, have been able to attract the best talent. So the most talented students do not want to work for the financial system, but they do want to work for uh, big techs uh, and fintechs. What are the disadvantages? Well, the absence of an installed and loyal customer base because there are entrants. Some obviously are getting there, but uh, not when they start. Limited access to soft information, although this they may um, compensate uh, with um, advanced technology like machine learning to transform uh, some of this digital footprint into hard information. A lack of reputation and brand recognition because they are entrants and uh, also a uh, high cost of capital, okay? And a small balance sheet. 
Although in some cases, like in, in the US, for example, a small balance sheet has not been an obstacle uh, for mortgage uh, lenders, fintech mortgage lenders, for example, uh, to operate because they sell basically the package and sell the loans to the government sponsoring the projects. Also, and finally, um, they have a lack of regulatory and risk management expertise and experience. And this is quite important uh, because this is a very regulated sector and obviously uh, you do not want to upset the regulator. And no access to the central bank backstop without a banking license, okay? All these are um, advantages and disadvantages of fintechs, which we may say entrance or small fintechs. When we uh, get to big tech platforms, then in principle, they have all the advantages, but with almost none of the drawbacks, except the last, the regulatory and central bank access to the, uh, to the uh, and access to the central bank bank stock, plus what? Well, lots of data, mm, exploitation of network economies, um, advanced technology to process information, uh, like in, uh, with machine learning, we, we've seen like they, they may, uh, this, uh, this technology analyzing digital footprints uh, may uh, do better than credit uh, bureaus than the traditional uh, technology, for example, for credit ratings. They have a deep pocket and also a uh, loaning power. So this means that big techs in principle have a potential more severe disruption capacity for the traditional uh, banking business. Now, to what extent uh, the emergence of fintech in general will make banking more contestable? Well, I think it is, but we'll have to uh, provide some caveats because there are some countervailing effects. Definitely this more efficient technology, uh, competitive pressure, but also I uh, have to think that even in the digital world, there are quite a bit of endogenous and exogenous switching costs and monopolization possibilities that we will discuss. And also the, the enhanced price transparency brought by digital technology may have ambiguous dynamic pricing effects, although this I will not have uh, time to uh, uh, talk about today. Let's go back uh, to the strategies of um, the, uh, the incumbents and the fintechs. So let, let's think rather now about the small entrant uh, fintechs. What are the potential strategies of those uh, uh, fintechs? Well, a, uh, a first uh, idea is that um, they may uh, commit to remain small. And what uh, in the IO term terminology would be to remain like a puppy dog, which is not uh, threatening. Maybe do not get a banking license and form partnerships and, and collaborate uh, with, the, uh, with incumbents, serve on bank segments of the population and therefore do not compete directly, obviously, with the banks, okay? Because you are serving uh, on short segments. Or, no, you be more aggressive, basically compete more head to head, entry maybe as a licensed digital bank. This has been less likely given the high compliance cost involved, but we see that some are, are taking this route. We'll see what happens in the end, whether they consolidate, self incumbents or grow to be a full-fledged financial intermediary. What about the incumbents? Well, the incumbents may discriminate by segment, uh, and uh, again, they have two types of strategy, accommodate or fight, right? If they accommodate, then in the animal terminology would be like a peaceful fat cat, okay? That will have to say, okay, I'll let you in, there are high switching costs, and I may even charge you some interchange fees to get to my base, and so on, we coexist or fight, like even trying to prevent entry or limit the entry with a top dog strategy, maybe shut down or degrade access to the, infra or the infrastructure, make life difficult uh, for, the, uh, for the entry. And obviously, uh, and some banks have done uh, that, uh, launch uh, their own fully online banks. You know? Some of the more savvy incumbents are launching fully online banks to test the waters and also compete with the fintechs. Okay. Now, what about the big techs? Uh, the big techs, again, they have in general the same type of taxonomy in terms of the strategies. They can accommodate or fight, let's say. Accommodating means to form partnerships. And there are quite a bit which are exploring. So City has a partnership with Google because City is only present in some major cities uh, and to uh, get more deposits. 
uh, partners with Google and Google gets information in exchange. Okay, so that's one example. Or credit cards uh, or, or credit with uh, Amazon and Bank of America, uh, Apple, Goldman Sachs, etc. Okay, so th there are some partnerships uh, which are mm, part uh, probably long term collaboration and part of it testing the world. Or uh, they can try to compete more head to head. One strategy, which is not the one we see uh, for now, is to become banks intermediaries, full fledged banks with a banking uh, license, exploiting all the uh, modeling their offerings, exploiting all the economies of scope they may. Um, but obviously, if they become banks and accept deposit, then they are subject to regulation or they may uh, fall short of that, okay, because then the, the regulatory job may be important. Or they may just um, take the strategy of a multi sided platform, a marketplace, uh, where um, in, in this platform, uh, basically, they do whatever the others do, but better. And they try to monopolize the interface with customers with their uh, ecosystem. And then basically have all the financial providers having to go through uh, the platform. OK. And I will, um, if, in fact, let, let, let me just uh, uh, explain this graphically and I'll come back to the incumbent. So this would be uh, the, the, uh, something like this, no? Uh, a future where it would be financial services providers, which basically go through a platform to sell the product. So, so basically all products uh, uh, would be sold eventually or mostly all products in a platform which could be in the ecosystem or a big tech or with an incumbent which has been kind of platform transformed let's say okay um the incumbents um and let, let me just uh, take a step back for a moment I may again accommodate or find Accommodate with the partnerships as we have seen uh, the examples I have put, or maybe providing some specialized, unique banking services and products, or five, no, compete head to head, also by becoming a, a, a platform or a marketplace, like I, I said here. Okay. Um, now here there are some pros and cons, uh, of, of the, or you do an advantage or disadvantages that the incumbents have. They may profit from some superior trust from customers and data security. Many people probably would rather trust their bank with financial data than Facebook, let's say. Okay, just to, to say, uh, to put an example. Uh, also, they have better regulatory uh, navigation skills and similar lobbying power than big tech. But what they cannot do is match the really the big tech's bundling cross subsidization strategy so the, in a sense, the ecosystem of the big techs is much larger and, and deeper and, and which can draw financial connections in many dimensions, which uh, for the incumbents is much more, uh, is much more difficult, okay? So the question is whether we're moving towards a kind of a new platform-based uh, oligopoly with some big techs and, and uh, platform transform, uh, transformed uh, incumbents okay to to distribute um, uh, financial products to different ecosystems okay and then the question is what degree of competition this will entail no uh, what's clear is that at the beginning the impact of digital disruption will be very strong okay and this will erode in common budget this is happening and fast in, for example in payments in cross payments and even in some uh, credit uh, products mortgages etc uh, um, and increased competitive pressure and contestability, obviously. This means, and as it is happening, incumbents have to restructure, they have overcapacity in branches, they have to invest more heavily in connection technology. Um, there is a lot of consolidation in Europe, in Spain, we have, we have quite a bit, for example, uh, now. But what about the long run impact? So this will depend on the extent of entry of. Uh, basically uh, big tech, which will depend quite a bit on regulation. If I have time, I will uh, make a note of that. But then the degree of competition between the platforms or ecosystems, um, which all try to kind of monopolize the interface with customers, but obviously this might be quite competitive because you are all trying to uh, do the same. And then the degree of competition between the, the, uh, these uh, 
big tech or platforms, if you want, um, will depend quite a bit of the switching costs, which will be there, and interoperability. So I think the basic idea here is that the more, um, the easier is to move from one platform to another, the more competition there will be, okay? So the more difficult is to move from one platform to another, the less competition. Will be. And this will be the key of, uh, this will be the key, I think, of the degree of competition in the market. And I am not sure that antitrust authorities have understood this yet, okay? I, I'm not completely sure. So because now we are taking just a, a track, uh, which is like saying that um, some big techs may be too dominant, uh, but maybe they are not paying um, enough attention to the possibilities of the competition among big techs and entering into their talks. But this is obviously an open issue. So uh, to end, um, should um, regulation aim at a level playing field? or favor entrants in order to promote competition? And what are the implications for financial stability? So just very briefly, because there is not much time. Well, regulation will be key, okay? And it's clear that the competitiveness of entrants will depend on the extent of regulatory burden and on the extent of the guarantees that they have or that they do not have, okay? And still it's not clear uh, where will be this. Will there be, and is there a level playing field? Well, there is not now, and we'll see how it will evolve. So for example, in open banking, now there is an asymmetry information sharing requirements in Europe, for example, between the directive and the privacy um, uh, laws, the GDPR. So in the sense that, for example, now banks have to open uh, their uh, data if the customer wants uh, to other competitors, but not the other way, okay? And, and so and this is something also the European Union uh, is thinking about. As I said, all the issues of data ownership, portability, portability and interoperability will be key for the, uh, uh, for, the, for the degree of competition. And what is being considered, obviously, is whether there, have been, there has to be different compliance burdens for dominant players or entrants. And now there is, you know, the US Congress uh, has, is looking at it, the UK has looking at it, and also the European uh, Union. You know? And this is, I think, is uh, developed. An important issue is that a principle that is, um, I think regulators try to establish, which is to regulate activities in the sense that the same risk should, the same regulatory rules should apply, is a principle that tries to be applied, uh, is problematic. Uh, it's problematic because what fails, if you think about financial stability, and now we have a bridge with financial stability here, is that uh, entities are those that, that fail. And therefore, regulators are rethinking also that, uh, that it's not so simple to apply the principle, same activity, same regulation, okay? Because it's not the same, the same activity in a small fintech than in a large fintech or a large income, for example, because of the systemic effects that it may have in different, uh, in, in different ways. Another point which is important and has to be taken into account is that high uh, regulatory pressure fosters shadow banking. Okay, so if you put a lot of pressure on the regulated entities, on, on the banks, for example, like in, uh, in mortgage providers in the US, well, then they become most of the uh, mortgages are provided by shadow banks, in which uh, a good uh, fraction are uh, fintechs. Uh, this is a usual problem that we know on regulation, but that, uh, again, has to be resolved. And obviously, with what's clear is that consumer protection now is paramount because of the issues that have been, uh, other people have already explained, uh, price discrimination, potential problems with data uh, prior privacy, potential exploitation through the digital uh, footprint, uh, footprint of behavioral biases of consumers, et cetera. Sevier, would it be yes. possible for you to conclude in uh, 30 seconds to a minute? Roughly? Okay, so Thank last you. slide, okay, so. Um, just uh, in, in 30 seconds, financial stability implications. Um, we know that increased competitive pressure decreases profits typically, and in particular of the incumbents, and this may uh, increase their incentives to take risks. So this has to be taken into account by the, by the regulators. But at the same time, this new technology, we have evidence that makes banks more stable, okay? So that individually, okay? So that banks that 
uh, have uh, are more advanced in IT adoption, they have less non-performing load. And also, uh, at the end of the day, we have to take into account the new sources of systemic risk, like the contamination of bank and non-bank activities uh, in platforms, uh, failure of third-party providers and cyber attacks, uh, which are becoming more and more uh, important. In fact, cyber attacks, I think it's, it's something that we'll be talking for a, for a long time. Uh, parallel systems are not uh, yet adequately monitored by the central banks, develop of large online money market funds, uh, which are not insured. So all these are new issues uh, that we have uh, to take into account. And I leave it here in the interest uh, of time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For additional thought on the subject, uh, let's go to uh, John Frost, please. Thank you very much. So we might um, need, need to, to be... unshare your screen. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So I'm going to pull up my slides. Here we are. So I'll just check that they're visible. Indeed. Perfect. Great. So it, it's a great pleasure to take part today and to discuss this contribution by Xavier. Uh, this gets to the heart of the industrial organization issues around fintechs versus big techs versus incumbents in the financial sector, and also the public policy trade-offs. So um, uh, you know, there's there's the triangle that uh, that Xavier had in the slides that discusses the, the trade-offs between different policy goals, and I think this is really key. Um, there's a lot to discuss here, but I'll be very brief and uh, let me note at the outset that these, uh, the usual disclaimer applies. So we've talked about financial inclusion and just to give some evidence to this, uh, you know, there has been a really very real impact of fintech and big tech players on financial inclusion, at least access to transaction accounts in countries around the world. I'll just highlight that in Sub-Saharan Africa, of course, it's been mobile money that's really driven this big increase in um, uh, access to the transaction accounts. And mobile money is often provided by telecom providers, you know, who we consider big techs. Uh, also in East Asia and Pacific and in South Asia, you see this really dramatic increase. And of course the big tech players, uh, Alipay, uh, Google Pay in India, uh, you know, these have played a very important role. And we talked a bit about the differences between, you know, advanced economies and emerging market economies, the potential for leapfrogging. I just wanted to provide some new evidence um, here that, that could help to put this in context. Uh, there is really a bifurcation at the global level. Um, we've seen, uh, if you look at the downloads of the, the largest finance apps, uh, this is from, from ongoing research, there's a there's a bifurcation. So FinTechs have seen wider adoption in advanced economies. This is in blue on the left. FinTech apps um, have been downloaded to a, a great extent. And big tech apps seen here on the right um, have made much larger inroads in emerging market economies. Uh, you'll see that there are some spikes, annual spikes in this. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, certain that uh, the uh, you know, uh, annual um, uh, periodicity in, in China is a, is a very large um, uh, explanation for this. Um, notably, if you look at concentration in um, the uh, downloads of finance apps, you can see that it's actually declined over time, both in AEs and EMEs. It's ticked up just a bit recently in AEs, um, as measured by the herfindahl hirschman index. So um, we see that um, you know there is this important difference in um, fintechs versus big techs um, in advanced versus emerging market economies. But so far, we've not seen a, a dominance um, of the market, at least at an aggregate level. Now, there's this key insight from uh, Xavier's work, uh, which is uh, you know, key to the industrial organization outcome that we should expect. Uh, they note that in the short run, digitalization will increase the contestability of banking services uh, mechanically if there are new entrants. And of course, there's greater competition and, and less concentration. But the long run impact um, is open and it depends on the market structure that prevails. So one of the scenarios that he discussed was that big tech firms uh, together with some platform transformed incumbents may monopolize the interface with uh, customers. And this is bold for emphasis. Now they make a convincing case that big techs have many of the advantages that fintechs have uh, without many of the drawbacks. But one drawback that big techs, at least in some jurisdictions, may face is trust by consumers to safeguard their data. 
We have new evidence. This will be coming out as a BIS bulletin this Thursday. We've looked at um, trust in different counterparties in the United States uh, based on the survey of consumer expectations uh, run by the Fed. Um, and then we compare this also with, uh, with views um, toward willingness to share data with certain counterparts in uh, countries around the world. Um, now in the United States, we see that uh, consumers trust traditional financial institutions the most to safeguard their data. Uh, they have the most trust in FIs, more so even than in fintechs or in government agencies. They have the least trust in big techs to, uh, to safeguard their data, according to the survey evidence. And if you look at the international picture, this is uh, from a joint work with EY, uh, you see a very similar pattern. So here, uh, the, the comparisons between traditional financial institutions, fintechs, and non-financial services companies, uh, which includes big techs in most cases, Again, you see that in nearly every jurisdiction, people trust traditional financial institutions with their data the most. Of course, they're used to entrusting their transactions data with banks um, and, um, and you know, much less used to using fintechs or, or new uh, non-financial services players. There's one exception to this trend, which um, I think our, our hosts may appreciate particularly, which is in China, uh, you can see that the trust in fintechs is actually higher than in traditional financial institutions. And in the case of China, um, there were some examples given in the EY survey in each case. Uh, the examples do include Alipay um, and, uh, and WeChat Pay, who are, of course, big techs. But in this case, they were, they were counted as fintechs. This shows you that there's also some murkiness around the terminology used in some cases of fintech versus big tech. Um, but in this case, uh, there actually is higher uh, trust in, in the likes of Alipay and, and WeChat Pay than in traditional FIs in China. The U.S. Um, and, and other countries uh, see a, a, a different pattern. Now, there are a number of responses, and of course, this gets into a lot of issues around uh, financial regulation that Xavier talked about, around uh, data privacy and data protection rules, and around competition and antitrust policy. But I'll just mention that there, are, you know, there are public policies being tried out to try to mitigate some of the trade-offs, and one, of course, is around public infrastructures. So I think a, a well-known example that um, you know, many people have looked at is, is UPI in India, of course, a retail fast payment system. And what's really striking about UPI is that it is dominated by big techs. So Google Pay, uh, Phone Pay, um, Paytm, um, which has investment, of course, by Ant, um, are, are the largest players in India in mobile payments. Um, but what you've seen is that, uh, you know, this is a very fast growing market, uh, but, you know, looking at the market shares within that, um, the concentration has actually been declining over the past year. So as this um, market is developing, it's allowed, I think, for fair competition between the different providers, Google Pay, Phone Pay, and um, Paytm all offer services to retail uh, clients. They have to compete on a level playing field. Um, and you know this has been quite a fluid market um, where you know each provider has to really compete to um, maintain retail services, and so to some extent this is you know a response to the kind of walled gardens. Um, this is an open system that uh, that really allows for uh, retail services to be provided in a competitive manner, taking advantage of the um, network effects of uh, big techs, their ability to embed payment services into their apps which are of course positive things that users value, but um, breaking up some of the, the potential for monopoly that, uh, that otherwise would uh, emerge. And I think that it's, a very, uh, it's very much in this light that of course the Chinese authorities are also considering the ECNY. The ECNY um, I think has been um, you know, uh, marketed very much as a response uh, to the current payment market, uh, which is dominated by the duopoly of Alipay and WeChat Pay. Um, and the authorities here are, you know, very much trying to uh, build a platform and infrastructure on which, um, you know, all of the providers, including the, the big tech providers, uh, compete on an even footing, can provide retail services, but then um, exchanging claims on uh, the central bank rather than uh, the, the current approach, which um, involves uh, funds that are, you know, held in escrow and then uh, deposited at the central bank as, uh, as reserves. So I'll um, I'll stop there, but uh, just to note that um, there, you know, again, there are very real benefits of uh, of big tech for financial inclusion. Uh, we have seen, um, you know, some really dramatic uh, changes. 
there is this question, I think, as to whether um, you know this monopolization of the client interface uh, will take place, as as Xavier mentioned. But at least in uh, emerging market economies, a number of authorities are considering uh, approaches that um, build a public infrastructure uh, that uh, aims to um, mitigate some of these uh, tendencies toward monopoly. Thank you very much.